Okay. Been a busy week. Yeah. All right, I'm about to put you on mute and go silent. Uh, when they get on, let them know everything is ready to go. If you go silent me, how in the world, how am I going to let them go? I said. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Y'all need me, just holler. Oh, hi. Hold on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Joe is um on mute. Oh, okay. Thank he you. told me to tell y'all something, but I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I think he said if you need help, call him or something like that. Okay. I, I had a senior moment. That's all right. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I had those times too, and I'm not a senior. <laughs> all right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, darling. Good morning. Hi, Bash Time. Good morning. Everybody's saying good morning. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Who is that? Don. <laughs> Thank you. 
We have one more minute before we start. Yes, he is on mute. Okay, well, it's nine o'clock, so I'm going to start. That's all right. As you know, I got to talk to God real quick. Mm. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you care for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. My heart, my mind, my soul belongs to you. You pay that price for me way back on Calvary. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that I had to speak to your people. Lord, I ask that you decrease me and increase you and only allow me to say the things that you want your people to hear. Allow us to not only be hearers of the word, but let us be doers of your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Okay, so today's lesson is entitled, David Anointed as King. The, de the devotional reading was from Acts chapter 13, verses 21 through 31. The background scripture that we're going to be going over today is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And this is in our unit, Out of Slavery to Nationhood, God's Exceptional Choice. Okay, so I'll be picking up pretty much where, um, picking up from where Deacon Miller left off last week. So Israel says, uh, to Samuel, uh, you getting old and we want a king. Samuel consults with God and God says, well, give them what they want. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So Israel's first king, Saul, is identified by the Lord and was anointed by Samuel. Saul was 30 years old when he became king. He was considered to be the ideal King, since he was tall, handsome, and courageous. But he was not obedient. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul and his army won one battle against the Philistines at an outpost, and he started talking big trade, y'all. The Philistines clapped back and said, oh, you want to be obnoxious now, and sent out 3,000 chariots 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Oops. 
Saul and his 5,000 men saw how outnumbered they were and hid. Some people even fled. Saul had his troops stay, Saul and his troops stayed in Gilgal for seven days, waiting for Samuel to meet a sacrifice to God. But when Samuel didn't show up on time, Saul's men started to scatter. So he took it upon himself to offer up the burnt offering. As soon as he finished, Samuel pulls up and he's like, bruh, what did I tell you to do? Didn't I tell you to wait? Samuel says, says we'll see what had happened was when I saw that, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you didn't come at the at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. I thought now the Philistines will come down across, will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Samuel says, you have done a foolish thing you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. And now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So you would think that Saul would have learned his lesson from this first um, disobedience, but he didn't. Because then in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, the Lord tells Saul to go and completely destroy the Amalekites and anything that belongs to them. Do not spare them, put, put them to, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. What does Saul do? He spares Agag, the king of the Malachites, and the best of the sheep and cattle and fat calves and lambs. So because Saul disobeyed a direct order, the Lord regretted making Saul king and decided to find another. Saul thought that it was cool to bring back the best of the cattle so he could sacrifice them to God. But Samuel had to remind him that the Lord takes delight in obedience over burnt offerings. Samuel then declares that the Lord had rejected Saul's personal kingship and had torn the kingdom from him, giving it to a more worthy man. Chapter 15 ends with Samuel's warning for Saul and our lesson starts at chapter 16. Verse one. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. In essence, God bluntly reminded Samuel that continuing to mourn was useless. God's rejection of Saul Saul as king was a decree that could not and would not be changed. Israel's life had had to go on, and the first order of business was to was to anoint a new king. So God, so God first instructed Samuel to fill his horn with oil. This horn, this horn refers to an animal horn. Animal horns were used not only for musical purposes but also to hold liquids such as oil, kind of like how we use the better, the uh, country crop, not only for butter, but for leftovers. And the sugar cookie can, once the sugar cookie's gone, we use it for a sewing kit. So <clears throat> Jesse was the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. Jesse and his family made their living as shepherds. Bethlehem was located in Judah, about five miles southwest of Jerusalem, and about 10 miles from Samuel's hometown in Ramah, in the territory of Ephraim. 
I found it interesting to learn that there are five towns named Rama in the Old Testament, which is why the territory of Ephraim is specified. Verse two, but Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. The most likely road to Bethlehem went through Gibba, which was the hometown of Saul. The odds were high that Saul or his family might realize that Sam, what Samuel was doing, which would put him in danger. Without an innocuous reason to travel, suspicion or curiosity would be aroused. Samuel was known for offering sacrifices when he traveled, so the Lord tells him to take a heifer. Verse three, invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. The Lord didn't give Samuel detailed instructions at this point. All he needed to know to proceed was to take a sacrifice and invite Jesse to be present for it. Samuel would walk by faith, eager for God's next instruction. Verse four, Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? It's unclear why the elders were afraid of Samuel, but Samuel did have a reputation for bringing punishment or bad news. Not to mention, he had just killed Agag since Saul didn't follow the Lord's instruction. Verse five, Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Samuel sex the elders' minds at ease by telling them he comes in peace. Consecration was an act of preparation that involved ceremonial washing to remove any ritual uncleanness and the donning of freshly washed clothes. The ritual of cleaning oneself for a sacrifice was an acknowledgement that ultimately no gift could, could even, no gift given to God that was could be good enough, but he would accept what came from a clean heart. Verse six, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the, before the Lord. Eliab was Jesse's oldest son. Being the firstborn son entitled him to high honor. He could expect to inherit double what his brothers would receive when Jesse died. Jesse probably brought his first son in front of Samuel first, assuming that this was another honor for the oldest son. Verse seven, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the, at look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Earlier, when Samuel introduced Saul to Israel, he called attention to his physical attributes. Now, as Samuel sought the next king, he assumed that God would use the same criteria again, but he was wrong. Samuel was, Saul was tall and handsome, but God had rejected him because he lacked the inner qualities essential to godly rule. Now God rejected Eliab as well in spite of his external attributes. It turns out that Samuel was looking with the man's eye and not God's. By nature, the things we see with pure eyes are earthly, external, and therefore often deceiving. But God is never deceived. He has insight that penetrates the heart. The term heart as used in Israel referred to the core or center of one's being. 
the seat of physical, mental, and spiritual life. When God penetrates the heart, he always evaluates people, people perfectly. It is important to note that God had not misjudged Saul. He knew his inner weaknesses. He, but he knew that the Israelites, he knew what the Israelites were looking for. And he chose him to show them that the ideal king must be more than outward appearances. God saw a man after his own heart, that is one whose heart was in tune to his. This was God's criterion, not good looks. The scripture has a clear message for our generation, which is obsessed with external appearance. We have been schooled by the image media to equate attractive with good. We have also been conditioned by an expanded economy to believe that bigger is better. Even our churches and Christian institutions are tempted to accept these illusions, but we can overcome them only if we take this caution from God's word and learn to see as he does to the heart of things. Mm -hmm. Verse eight, then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by Samuel. Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit until he arrives. It seems that Jesse probably considered the youngest son so in insignificant for this occasion that he didn't bother to bring him. Jesse, like Samuel, had a skewed set of values. The son who had been ignored was the most important one of all, and his presence was essential to the feast. Verse 12. So he sent for him and he and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Even though the Lord does not look at outward appearance, the youngest was a good looking young man. The Hebrew word translated glowing with health is a rare word Hebrew, is a rare word in Hebrew for physical description that implies the color red. Elsewhere, it describes Esau's appearance at birth. This has been interpreted to mean Esau looked healthy and robust or, or alternatively that he had red hair or rosy cheeks. Continuing with verse 12. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Though David had been Though David had not been sanctified with the with his father and brothers for the sacrifice, the Lord indicated that not only would David participate, but he would be but he would be anointed as Israel's next king. Verse thirteen. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Here, all David's brothers stood freshly washed and in their best clothes, ready for a feast. David comes in from the fields, unwashed, smelling like sheep. Yet, he was the honored one. While this might be puzzling or troubling to the brothers or onlookers, we know that God had chosen David based on the state of his heart. Though he, had, though he hadn't cleaned the outward dirt, inside David had a heart turned to God and ready to do his will. In conclusion, Israel's first king Saul had proved to be unacceptable. God's choice was still to be revealed. 
Samuel was given the assignment of traveling to Bethlehem and anointing one of Jesse's sons to be Israel's next king. None of Jesse's older sons were found to be acceptable, but David, the youngest, was the one anointed as future leader of God's people. We should never assume that people's obvious attributes qualify him or her for higher service. We should also not assume that a lack of obvious attributions um, disqualifies the person from being greatly used by God. We should pray and ask God to help us see as he sees, look at the heart and not outward appearance. Thank you. Is there any questions, comments, concerns? Very good lesson. Thank you. I enjoyed it. But we need to add to just a little bit to that to bring it home to us today because it's not uncommon for people to experience fear concerning the calling the, um, they have been um, given on our lives. Um, we're like David, we fear, but we have to learn how to trust God. Mm -hmm. However, our, um, those feelings are, it should not keep us uh, as believers from serving as the Lord has appointed us to perform our, um, whatever task he has assigned us. God will equip us to do what we need to do. When he asks us to do something, we may not have the plans, but if we wait on him, he'll show us the direction. Yes, um, the last thing is being obedient. David, I mean, Saul was not, uh, did not do what God told him to do. And God knew that he wasn't gonna do that. But we as believers, we have to learn how to, take some things out of our lives so that we can make room to do the mission that God has assigned us. You want, we brought a wonderful lesson and I learned some things from you this morning. Be blessed in your work for the master. God bless you. Any other comments? Additions? And I, I'll say this, uh, I have enjoyed the lesson. I'm working in the background here. Uh, we had a break in, in our church yesterday, so we took all the equipment out. Um, oh, wow. so I'm setting everything back up today, but I was listening uh, to what you said. And I like the fact that you pointed out that God didn't make a mistake with Saul. God knows what we want. And sometimes he gives us what we want so we can find out what we need. Um, and I congratulate you on your pronunciations. <laughs> <laughs> I look each one on Google. <laughs> you know, uh, tell, tell your daddy to let you use his log off. So it'll give you the exact <laughs> pronunciations of. <laughs> but uh, you know, you pointed out that Ramoth there were uh, five different locations, and that this was actually Samuel's uh, hometown where he was born. Um, that's where he held court. So wonderful job, uh, great job. Uh, I got a question. You know, it mm -hmm. says Samuel was known for when he traveled to offer sacrifice, to give. What do mm -hmm. we give when we're traveling? Are we still willing to serve? Are we still willing to make sacrifices for God when we're traveling? Or is it all about us? Or do we mm -hmm. remember God when we're traveling? God bless you. Wonderful job. God bless you. Okay, well, if there are no other comments or questions or additions, um, next week lesson, I believe, is going to be taught by Sister Ross. Um, and the title is God Picked You. The devotional reading is from Esther chapter 4, verses 5 through 17. The background scripture is from Acts chapter 19, Ephesians chapter 1, verses one through 14 and Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven. Um, I thought I saw Pastor Thornton on, did he get off? He was on, I just saw him. Uh, maybe he's pulling up outside, I don't know. 
Okay, well, I'll have my father. <laughs> I'll have my father do the closing prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day, for reminding us of so many wonderful things out of the word of God today. Oh God, we thank you for all of David. We thank you for the example of Saul. We thank you, God, for the obedience of Samuel. We just thank you, God, for all these many multitude of blessings. And somehow, God, let us apply these things to our heart. We won't judge from the outward appearance. We'll let you do the judging and guide us in decision making. We thank you, God, for all your blessings and mercies this day. Please, God, this day, according to your will, that someone this day, oh God, this Lord's day, somebody will come to know you as Savior and Lord. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Walk with the King, y'all. We'll see you next week. You know, hey, I was trying to say something, but I couldn't figure out how to get my microphone and stuff to work for me. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was having a senior moment, but I love the lesson. Thank you very much. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Tony, every morning is a senior moment for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe. God bless you. <laughs> Everybody have a wonderful service today. I'll talk right. to you. <laughs> All right, to tell your pastor I say hello. Uh, yes, sir. Will do. Thank you. God bless. All right. Bye, everyone.